Some of the best videos I've done have just been spontaneous ones. Episode 120. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking to an architectural TikTok superstar. He goes by the moniker of Architect Russell and is otherwise known as the fabulous Russell Henderson of Estim Construction. He's actually based in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Now, Russell and I became acquainted on my favorite social media app, which is TikTok. Russell has accrued an enormous following. He's got about 200,000 followers, probably when, probably more when this, when this episode goes out. And I've absolutely loved Russell's content over the last year. He actually makes building regulations fun, interesting, and witty. And he's able to make these very captivating 15 second videos uh, about architecture, about the processes behind architecture, um, about the thinking around architecture and the experience, what it's actually like to be an architect. And of course, it's resonating very deeply with a, with the audience on TikTok. Um, and I think it's an, an extremely good example of innovation uh, and how architects can be using new social media platforms to communicate their message and even broaden out and create new revenue streams and new ways of connecting with a non-architectural audience. So in this episode, Russell and I discuss TikTok, how he uses it, his career, which has um, spanned in many different countries, what it's like working as a Ruber qualified architect, but he's lived and worked in Australia, in Perth, uh, and now how he became located in Tanzania and what his role involves there. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the TikTok superstar and YouTuber, Russell Henderson. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Russell, yes, welcome, so you. welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here. And you are based in Tanzania. You're an architect. Yeah, that's right. Um, where were yeah. you? Where? How did you end up ending up in Tanzania? Oh, I can start from the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> um, or I can go backwards from Tanzania and go backwards the day from there. I can start from when I. I'll start from when I graduated. Um, okay. So um, if I look through my LinkedIn here, I'll get some dates. Yeah, so I became, I studied in the UK, because um, I'm from the UK, I'm English. Um, I went to University of Huddersfield, up north of England. Right, okay. Um, so I did all my part one, part two, part three, all that stuff there. And um, I'm kind of from the Cambridge area in the UK. I okay. worked in Cambridge for a couple of years. And, and then I worked, after I graduated, I worked in Leeds for a couple of year, years as well. And um, Worked for a couple of big architecture firms like IDAS and uh, Atkins, yeah. stuff like that. And then I'm just around the recession. I was just lucky. I managed to get registers chartered, did my part three around that just when the recession hit. 
uh, which is around, where is that? It's around 2008, I think, yeah, yeah. isn't it? So I just finished that. And around that time, they were making redundancies, and I was one of them. But luckily, I kind of applied for um, a visa to work in Australia. Um, mm. Like, a, you know, you get one of those years. When you're under the age of 30, you can work there for a year. Um, and when I, uh, I've always wanted to work abroad and um, I, when I studied architecture, the course I did was a, um, like an international course. So right. I studied, we had like a semester where you study in like one year we went to Arizona for like a month and studied there and designed in Arizona. Mm. And then another year we went to Jordan in the Middle East to study there for a month. Wow. And so we had experience. So I always... So one of the only, I think, architecture courses in the UK that has an international pathway. Right. And you kind of go, you kind of go to the university in that area and you go, go, like when we were in Jordan, we would go to the University of Jordan and have lectures there and stuff while we were there. And same in Arizona as well. So it's, it was quite a good experience. And you design in hot climates, different climates and things mm. like that. So it kind of planted, um, planted so that. The- the wanderlust in you yeah and i always wanted to work at board because i wasn't a big fan of the uk really you know the um the weather and, <laughs> like, and everything and uh, i knew i wanted to like work abroad uh, and um, i've been i always like traveling and stuff um so yeah so i left the so i left my job in the uk and i was on my way to australia but i stopped to go and work there um, just after I became chartered and everything, um, but I stopped off in a couple of places. Um, so I stopped off in a few places. Um, I visited a friend in Cairo for a couple of weeks. So I stopped off at Cairo um, and then I went to uh, Thailand. And then while I was in Thailand, I was only there for like, I was only planning on there for like a week, two weeks, I think, kind of a holiday mm. before I go to Australia. Um, and then I applied for a job, saw a job advertised there as like an architect and I applied for it and I got it. I, <laughs> and it was in Bangkok and, um, it, and I ended up there for a year, like a year. I didn't even go to Australia. So I worked there for about a year at this firm, but it was more interior design work really, more yeah. than architecture. Um, it's a quite a big company. Um, and that didn't, it was a good experience. I loved being there and everything, but I didn't, it kind of had a bit of a nasty ending. Um, like I, I left the job and then I looked, I tried to find another job while I was there and I just, I couldn't find another job. I had loads of interviews, but like, I think it was visas. So I was like, turned out the job I got there was a kind of a miracle. You don't get many architects, British architects in Bangkok. So I was quite lucky to have that. And um, anyway, I cut a long story short. Sure, um, Cut a long story short, I left Thailand and then went to Australia because by that time, I, I applied for a permanent residency for Australia, which takes about two years. Mm. So I applied for that before I left England as well as the temporary one, and that came through, so I ended up going to Australia. And I, so I ended up working there for uh, nearly two years, I, mostly healthcare, uh, hospitals and stuff, like projects right. I'm working on. Work, it's quite casual work there. It, everyone likes, like, um, it's all contract work there, and they're really casual with their... Where, whereabouts in Australia were you? Uh, that was uh, Perth, that was. That was in Perth, right, okay. Yeah, because I had a friend who um, lived there and um, knew the place, so he recommended going there. Um, and I had already visited Australia before, and... Um, um, Sydney was kind of too expensive and I didn't like Melbourne much. Um, so I thought I'd go to uh, try Perth and yeah, within a month, I got like a couple of months, I got a job and um, started working again. And um, it was all healthcare. Cause I, when I worked in IDAS in the UK, I was working on healthcare. Yeah. And because of that experience, I, I worked in on hospitals and stuff in Perth, but it was all contract work and it kind of did my head in a bit. Um, they, they took their jobs quite casual there and um, they, people didn't think much about like changing jobs every three months or every two months. And I didn't really feel comfortable doing that. Um, so 
um, that kind of did my head in. So in the space of a year and a half, I, I worked at about three different companies, um, like contract work. Yeah. Um, then um, I got a call. Um, it came from LinkedIn. Um, I got a, I got a, I think I have a message or from an agency in Ireland um, saying, would you be interested in working in Tanzania? And, so, and, you, and I, I thought, oh, I thought they meant, first of all, I thought it meant Tasmania in Australia because <laughs> it was a similar, similar word. <laughs> and I started looking, at, started looking it up and thinking, oh, that's quite interesting. Because I know really, most people are not that, never think about Africa. And I never mm. really thought about, a lot of pe- most people think of South Africa. They always, people go on holiday to South Africa. And that, that, that didn't really interest me, South Africa, because it's quite westernized and stuff. Yeah. Um, but Tanzania, and when I started looking up, it looked really interesting. And it's like proper Africa, you know. And, mm. uh, I've always been interested in working in developing countries ever since I studied in Jordan and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I had the owner of the company interviewed me in Perth because he, um, he studied in Perth. So I interviewed him and next thing you know, um, offered me the job. And then he offered me a job and there was a, another architect working already in Tanzania working for the um, construction company. Um, he was an Australian architect, so he was kind of my boss. Mm. Um, he's like the head of... So we have an architecture department in the... It's a, com, it's a construction company. And we have an architecture department and um, yeah, we, the company has their own projects that basically buy the land and design it themselves. So uh, me and my boss, we design the buildings or sometimes I get my own projects. Um, we, we can actually de- we design the buildings ourselves and the company builds them ourselves as well. So we do everything ourselves. It's really good. Um, and the um, UK, like I was, just doing most of the work, I was doing like construction drawings all the time. I was getting fed up a bit in the UK. So I, well, I never really designed a building properly until um, I reached Tanz- Tanzania. Um, okay, you dabble here and there, and um, you try to get experience and stuff. But I got fed up with all the directors doing all the design work and then passing it on to you. Um, and you just end up for like literally two years doing construction drawing. Yeah. So it's like in the UK. And it's, I was mostly doing that in Australia as well. Um, it's a, um, construction drawings. Um, so yeah, as soon as we got to Tanzania, it's a, when I had the interview, it's like, don't worry. You know, I, I told them all this at the interview. It goes, I want to design buildings, you know. I, um, okay, um, they keep telling you in the UK, oh, you need more construction experience. You need this experience. Go, mm. Yeah, I've had that now. Um, when can I design a building? <laughs> and, um, um, but, and he said, yeah, don't worry, you'll be designing buildings, definitely. Um, don't worry about that. We've got those projects. So, and then, yeah, as soon as we landed, we just hopefully... Um, and, and, and when was that? When did you arrive in Tanzania? So that, that was... I've been here... Um, that was um, 2013. So I've been here six, nearly seven years now. And he, and you yeah. found that um, you were given more responsibility as an architect. Your architectural responsibilities kind of expanded from the. Yeah, well, fast. When I first got there, of course, I was working under. Um, he's a Australian architect. I was working under with him. Mm. It was just me and him and one other guy, assistant. Um, and um, so we were doing it. He he kind of designed the concept, and we worked on that like a hotel and then another project came along after a month and basically I was, I was practically designing it but um kind of he was under my, he was like looking over me and that, that was it really but then um once it got to the stage when like he was happy with me I, I kind of just looked after the project mm. and then that, and that got built within two years that was an office building three four-story office building in in Dar es Salaam and they, got the first lead rated building in Tanzania, got lead gold, which is the first uh, lead building. Uh, and then as soon as I finished, uh, while I was doing that, a massive project, we were working on, we were working on this together, but I kind of looked up, and I looked after that after, like we got past concept as well. We worked on it together and concept, it was like a, God, shopping, uh, 
two-storey shopping mall, two 20-storey office towers, an 11-storey hotel, um, about four, about 12-storey apartments. In the, in the uh, mall, it's got cin- cinema. Mm. That's all, that was all one project. So, um, so we're working on that as well. That was in Dar es Salaam. And um, so at the same time, I was working on that. And then after a year, that got started construction as well. And that, so that, that has been, that's just about finished now, the construction of that. But it's on hold now, it's nearly towards the end. It's, they've kind of run out of money, so it's on hold. That's for a private, that's for a client though. That's not owned by the company. Right, okay. Company. So, so basically the company that you work for, they do their own developments. You're part of the, yeah. in, the in-house architectural team. Um, yeah. that, that kind of goes through the entire process from concept right through to delivery of the projects on site. Um, what would you say are the differences? What are the sort of obstacles that you find working in somewhere like Tanzania and what are some of the opportunities? Um, the main thing you notice is the regulations, less rules and regulations here. That's, the first thing you you notice, and is that um, good or bad? <laughs> uh, when you got when the first couple of years, it's it's really good. You practically um, do what you want. There's, there's a, there is a planning department. It kind of just gets approved. <laughs> you don't really get. It. You, they don't tell you like um, we just use um, our common sense. You know, oh, we have okay, we can't build right to the place of the boundary. We'll leave some meters there. We can't go that high and stuff in that position. We kind of, and I don't know, yeah, but that kind of, we, we kind of don't deal with that as much. We kind of, it kind of gets signed off by a local architect. Mm. Um, who, um, who is, who kind of, I don't know if they, they kind of, uh, they get it approved through the planning, but nothing gets, nothing seems to get rejected or, <laughs> or we don't really, really, um, so it, that, and as for building regulations, as far as I know, there aren't any. Mm. And um, wow, uh, there's a. Um, so, 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 do you guys build to like another country's building regulations? Like you bring. I, your... I build to the UK one. Right. Okay. Yeah, so I'm really I'm pretty clued up on the British building rig, and the Australian one as well. So we go by that really. Um, um, is the the company Australian or is it? No, from India originally. Right. Okay. But they're Tanzanian. Tanzanian. I think the, the owners. I think they're half there. Okay, so they don't make any requirements of you that you need to be building to a particular nation's building regs. Was that something that you guys? Uh, have we taken? Did, yeah, we decided that we'll go for the British one. Got it. Yeah. yeah. And and are buildings typically quite fast in their turnaround then? Like in the UK, obviously, you know, planning can take up, take up, it can take up years sometimes, some of the scales of buildings that you're talking about as well. Yeah, that's the thing. I was working on the hospital in Perth, and when I moved to Tanzania, after two years, I designed and built, nearly finished the building, and they were still building the hospital I was working on in Australia. But while I was um, in Tanzania, it was, it was, you... you um, God, they're so fast. They're like, they just want to build it. They want to get on site and get it done straight away. They're not even messing around. Like, you practically, you, um, you haven't finished the drawings, but they're already starting building. They all, they all start digging and doing the foundations and everything. They haven't mm-hmm. even finished it properly yet. Um, they, they, the trouble is, it's, it's, you do a concept and they practically build from that. Mm. And um, so, you, and I don't think a lot of, I suppose it's design and build, but um, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's, it's confusing because um, other projects that are not in-house projects, they get a concept and then they ask the contractors, we have to sort the rest out, and we end up changing it all and everything. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I suppose it's design and build, isn't it? Really, you kind of do a concept and then they start building from that, and it's the contractor's job to kind of. And, build it. and and is there a lot of building work happening? Um, there there was, but the last couple of years, it's 
it got a bit political and um, um, I don't want to go into it, but um, uh, it's, it's slowed down a bit. But it's the fastest, it's in the top 10 fastest growing cities in Africa, or in the world, I think, as well. Um, yeah. And, but, um, and, and what was it like for you then acclimatizing as well to the climate and the city and the culture? How's that, how's that process yeah. been like for you, sort of both professionally and personally? So that time, that was nice because, um, you know, I hadn't been, I mean, I hadn't been, during all this time, I, I still haven't, I haven't been back to the UK. I haven't left, I haven't been back to the UK for 10 years now. So as soon as I left, um, I haven't even gone there for a holiday yet. Um, so as soon as I left, like I've got the job, left the UK during recession, I, you know, I was in Cairo, then Thailand, then Australia, then Tanzania. So all those countries have been quite warm anyway. Australia was actually, Perth was actually quite cold during the winter, which was a bit, they don't tell you that. They think everyone tells you Australia is warm, but it, is, <laughs> it, does, it's, um, it does get quite, it's not that warm in the winter and stuff. And mm. Melbourne is even worse, and Perth is quite a warm climate. But when I got to Tanzania, it's, it's, it's not, it's not that, it's not like Southeast Asia. It's not like really um, humid and sweating. It's quite dry. It's not that. It's hot, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really nice. It's the nicest um, climate. Uh, one of the nicest I've been to. I think it's, mm. it's kind of bearable, you know. It's, so the weather is, is probably the best thing I like about it. So I don't have a problem with the weather. They do have mosquitoes here. You get malaria. So I'm a bit worried about that. But um, they're, compared to when I lived in Thailand, there's mosquitoes everywhere, you know. But here, there's hardly, you hardly get bitten at all, really. There's not much mosquitoes here, really. It's just that you have to be careful. I did, oh, I did get dengue fever. Um, <laughs> Uh, recently, that's the first time I've ever been ill. Um, I think the beginning of the when was it? I think it was the end of last year. I got angry fever, which is a bit like malaria. So I had that, but I didn't really notice. I just um, by the time it was about by the time I knew what it was, I went to the doctors. It was going away anyway. But mm. and that's the first. That's the only time I've been sick really. Um, there's um. They have rainy seasons, um, which are not that bad. Um, um, only rains a few days here and then. For like in March, it rains for like a couple of weeks, like not every day. And then in November, has another rainy season, like the odd day, but not every day. Yeah. But it gets to hit each other's here. The roads are really bad. There's like some roads, there's sometimes in, so I live in Dar es Salaam, like, which is like the main biggest city. Which has it, which is next to the coast as well. So there's nice beaches here, but during the rain, because um, of the lack of roads, it gets really muddy. And um, I hate to think like some of these uh, poor people in the houses, like during the rainy season, all the mm. mud and everything. Because in um, Southeast Asia, when it rains, it's just concrete and they just sweep it and it's fairly clean. But here, when it rains, there's a lot of mud around sometimes. So that's yeah. a bit nasty. You know? Um, and then um, I haven't, because I don't, because the company is not really um, weird thing about it is um, because um, the company I work for, the construction workers are all um, locals, but where I work in the office and everything, you know, either, so for my um, the guy I work with, um, he's Australian, and the other guys are mostly Indians, so I don't really. Um, um, get a chance to speak the local language much apart from you know when I go out. Um, What's the local language? Thing, Swah Swahili. Swahili, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same as uh, Kenya. Right. Yep. And another thing is, don't get a chance to learn it as much. I work six days a week as well. Right. <laughs> and the okay. hours and the hours are uh, between eight and um, five. Is my standard. So I work on Saturdays as well. But, um, a full day on a Saturday? Uh, or? Yeah, I try to drift off early when I can, but um, but the uh, money the money is a lot better than um, all my other previous jobs. 
mm. and uh, all my jobs in the UK, Australia. In fact, I was looking up. Um, my shop should say this actually, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. Um, I was looking up a director in London, and um, uh, but um, send that money to the director in London in a large package. Yeah. Um, actually, um, you might want to. That's what there's something we want to hear. They want to hear the 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 uh, um, the, the uh, and let's just say the um, the money's quite good compared to all the other countries I've been to. Um, so that's the that's what keeps me here. But um, another reason why it keeps me here, well, I did like it here as well. But it just like, every time I look to other jobs, like see what else is out there, Dubai and. Hmm. Like, uh, other places I think it worked, China or something, other places I might be interested in working in. I look at the job role and like, jobs never as good. Like, um, and the packages never look as good. And um, every time I look, I look to see what else is out there, I never see anything is, that interests me anymore. Like, um, so um, I'm quite lucky. Um, um, it's a good job. And I'm like, the job is fantastic, really. I'm... Um, like doing everything, like what I wanted to do, like from initial concept to on site and everything. Um, and seeing a building, I mean, I go to a site when there's nothing there, and it's like an empty site, like proper dining buildings, design something, and then you see the whole thing being constructed from start to finish. It's what I always wanted to do. And um, something, something like that usually. I don't know. Um, it's just quite lucky, you know. Well, it's the it's 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 interesting. Do you, do you think that? Uh, I mean, my uh, family when I was about sixteen or so, we all moved to Hong Kong, and my dad worked in construction, and uh, he worked in the form work side of things. And we all we all flew out to Hong Kong, and he was working on Chet Blackcock and got to travel around the world. And then they stayed expats. I came back to UK to do uni and they stayed as expats in Hong Kong, then in Australia, then in Dubai, then Abu Dhabi, but they kind of kept that lifestyle for, you know, 25 years or so. Um, and absolutely loved it. Do you think there's a certain kind of personality that, that can, that deal with it or that really, that can really enjoy it? Is it for, is it for everybody? Um, no, I don't, no, not really. Cause, um, a lot of people, you know, they just, they can't have, they can't be away from me. A lot of people like, they don't, they can't stay away from England. Um, I, I had practically nothing much there, but my family are there, my mum and dad and my brother. Mm. But, um, okay, I had some friends, but <laughs> I'm not that that often really. <laughs> <laughs> I know I was lucky as well, cause I didn't, I knew I was going to leave, so I didn't buy anything much, you know. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a flat. I didn't have all that stuff. I didn't have a wife. I didn't have a, well, a serious girlfriend anyway. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so um, a lot of those things tie, tie you down. Because when you study, like, architecture is so long. Mm. And um, you probably, a lot of people, they like, have houses and cars, but I purposely didn't buy any. And a lot, a lot of people... You know, they, I don't know how many people would not like me. I like, haven't been back in ten years. It's a bit crazy. I don't mm. really get many people with that kind of. I don't. I don't really miss it either. Really, which is strange. Mm. Um, um, yeah, you probably. Um, it depends on um, if you got a lot of um, family and close friends. I think in oh, the UK. Are, are the because. I was going, well. I was, I was going to ask about the the kind of the packages that are available nowadays. You know, certainly, I remember when my when my family was uh, traveling and living expat life. There were uh, the sorts of the difference between what you were earning in the UK and then what you would be earning abroad was it was enormous. And often you'd get you know kind of really good expat packages and deals and all that kind of stuff. Does that stuff still exist these days? That's what I thought. I don't think they do um, much this, because the, after the recession, that's why I, I can't. I, I don't. When I look for jo see jobs, I've been researching. I don't see anything as good as 
is what I get now. It's like mm. after the recession, you know, Dubai went down. You can't. If people, I went to Dubai. Um, I was even looking at Hong Hong Kong. So I went there uh, a couple of Christmases ago for a holiday. I'm always interested in, in to see what it's like working in other countries. And um, Dubai, people are saying most people nowadays are just expats are just going there on a short contract and then they just get they just leave they're not, not there uh, that's the not there very long it's like contract work that's what it's going to say like mm. when i worked in australia it was all contract work and when i had the interview to come here i said i wanted a permanent job I'm looking for like i want to i said i want a long-term career job and that's what we're that's what was advertised for this position as well they, they wanted someone um permanent yeah, it's a, it was. It's not. It wasn't. It's not a contract job. I took it. It's a permanent position, mm. um, which I wanted as well because I got fed up of um, jumping around. You no, know, I wanted a career. Yeah, I wanted a career. And um, and so let's 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 um, segue a little bit into your social media exploits because I see that's how how we met. Was I found you on the wonderful app that is known as tiktok and there's there's a lot more architects on it well in the last probably couple of months than there have been uh before but it's it's a lot of it's a lot of fun and you're quite active there and you've also got you know quite a, a an active and um youtube channel that you use and you, you do a lot of videos how did this has this always been a passion of yours making videos talking about architecture um how did that begin I've, well, it started um, uh, just over, just about a year and a half ago. Um, I don't have, I have a girlfriend, but I'm not married and I don't have shit kids. I <laughs> need some kind of hobby. <laughs> <laughs> like all the, all the Indian guys at work, they're like 18 years old and like married and they've got kids and stuff. And I'm not, um, oh, that's probably the other, that's, kind of my personality a bit I, I don't really I'm not I don't really want I'm not really at the moment I'm getting old now I'm like 42 I think mm. um, but I still not that bothered about having kids that is just me uh, um, maybe one day I'll wake up I said to my parents I said I'll wake up one day and I'll suddenly want them um, but at the moment um, I, I don't, don't particularly want any um, anyway um so, um, uh, how did it start? I think I bought a drone, I think, for a hobby to start off with. So mm. I started playing around with a drone and filming. And then, ah, uh, that was it. Um, um, Casey Neistat, you know Casey Neistat? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, big YouTuber. I started watching him and I was like, fascinated. I was like watching his vlogs for like days. And then I started getting, Tanzania finally started to get some really decent internet here as well. Um, when I first moved here, the internet was pretty bad, and I only had a mobile. I only bought a smartphone like a couple of years after I moved here. Mm. Um, so then I now, and then I got um, like two years ago, I got then around that time I got I could actually watch 4K on my. I bought a TV and I got I can watch 4K videos on YouTube and stuff. Mm. So I got started getting into YouTube because so I had fast internet connection. So I started watching. Casey nice that stuff and I really loved his videos they were amazing and um because he was into cinematography and stuff so and then and then I went to the Philippines and whole day I thought oh, I'll try a bit of this I tried tried doing some vlogs and stuff and um I just went went because my girlfriend's from Philippines so um, we went to the Philippines and um I just did a vlog every day for like two weeks but I didn't I just stored all the stuff on um on my um, cameras and then when I came back I just every week I just edit one and then post one on YouTube every week so I would make so last year I did a video every week one video a week the whole year nearly um, then I went to other places um, really like uh, um, I did some uh, videos in Tanzania and Thailand and um, other stuff. Um, and then I covered some events as well. And, and then a lot of Tanzanian people started following me as well. 
this is weird. They start to they like um, I think because it's kind of because I like traveling, so it's the videos are kind of between travel and architecture. Yeah. I try to do so much, not so much. There's not much architecture. I try and do more because I always get the feeling people are a bit. They don't want to, they get bored of it. They don't want to see architecture. <laughs> then they get a bit bored of it. So, but I visit some build. I went to China as well and visit some skyscrapers and I did videos about that and stuff. Um, but, and then there's like a couple of videos I did that got quite a lot of views. So I went on a, so I had a project in um, Zambia, which is a country nearby, and I yeah. did a like a video of Air Tanzania, which is like the local airline. Mm. It's kind of quite controversial, like government stuff. You're not allowed to say anything bad. Mm. And um, and I did a like a review of the airline. I don't know what I was doing, and I said I said like like um, bad things like <laughs> on, the, on the video. And I showed it to my girlfriend. She said she you can't. I've edited it, and so she I gave like marks out of five and stuff like the airline. And um, I said to my girlfriend, she said you can't can't post stuff, you'll get into trouble from the government. So I thought, I don't know what to do. I spent, spent all week like editing it. So then I um, I edited it around and gave uh, like full marks for everything, like top score. And like, it's really weird because it looks psycha- sarcastic. <laughs> I'm like being sarcastic saying, oh, like the food is like, I'm, like, I'm not enjoying the food or something, but I gave like five out of five for food. And then the plane was like, yeah, 45 minutes late and I said oh don't worry it was just, I still enjoy myself so I got by that by and then um, anyway I gave it full marks and it got like loads of views and everyone like all Tanzanians are saying like oh thank you you're a good man you really like our country and all this stuff um, so that, that was a bit of a funny one um, then um, so I've been doing that for a, a year and then TikTok came along and um, uh, I didn't really pay much attention to TikTok until about January and then February, March. Then I started, I was talking to you about it. I was watching Gary V and he was, he was going on about TikTok and, uh, and, I, and I looked at it, it looked a bit funny and then I thought, no one's really doing, um, everyone's just doing that. When I watch people dancing on TikTok, I don't really watch it. I scroll on and I watch the other stuff. Like, yeah. It interests me you can find what you want on tiktok if you like um travel or if you like architecture you can find it um but no one was really doing any there's not many people doing vlogs and stuff so i started doing the same kind of thing i was doing for the and all the time i was doing the youtube stuff the amount of stuff i learned about making videos and editing was crazy i learned so much and and then vlogging starts i started to get a bit better on camera well, I hope so anyway. And um and it's amazing how much vlogging can improve you personally. Like you start understanding what um people's perception of you and what you say, like the yeah, Tanzania thing, like you know, you have to learn you gotta say something good, you know. You can't mm-hmm. say if you start saying something bad then people are gonna take it negatively and they're not gonna like you and um you I can you can joke about it and stuff, but um, yeah, you gotta be positive really when you do things like that. Um, so, because I'm to, honestly, I'm sometimes I'm quite a negative person. Like some of my previous blogs, I, I videos I did on YouTube, I'm kind of saying bad things about the place and stuff. Mm. But as you get more and more, you kind of learn, and then you progress, and you kind of you kind of get a better. You need research stuff as well. You just kind of learn. So you, you become a better person from doing vlogs, I think, in videos. Um, your presentation skills, researching, learning about whatever you're doing a video about. So there's a lot of benefits from it, you know. And then you learn all this software I've been learning, Premiere Pro and, oh my God, it's a headache. Um, well, it's, it's, it's so, great because your, your TikToks are really well-crafted little pieces even if you're just doing a kind of quote of an architect you've kind of you know there's lots of different there's lots of different sort of uh camera angles that you're using and each one's often a kind of quite a nice concise i mean that's the the beauty of tiktok is it's this really short form you've got to be kind of entertaining you've got to be kind of quite sharp and punchy with it 
Um, and obviously the platform in the last few months, like, I mean, there's so much interesting things on TikTok, people using, um, you know, being really, really creative, all sorts of different industries and creative people starting to, um, you know, jump on it. And the demographic is changing in terms of like a lot of, a lot more millennials and exennials and older are kind of starting to use the platform. And, uh, but it does, like you say, that there's, there's a real craft to learning grab somebody's attention and to create a little story yeah. in, sh in a short period of time and it's uh, when i first saw it i think like first when first song first showed me it, i wasn't interested because it looked like attention seekers you know mm. just, oh, look at me like they just want your attention so when i first saw it it kind of put me off but then you kind of look you start looking at it properly but I learned, like, you get, when you do YouTube, you get all this, when you, you create a video, and it gives you all this analytics of how the video does, and, like, it tells you, like, when someone drops off. Mm. If someone drops off the first 20 seconds, it'll, it'll tell you exactly. So you learn from that. So you, the next, like, so, like, for instance, um, say I, like, learn the first 10 seconds, or if I, if I just talk to the camera for the first 20 seconds and show my face, um, people will drop off mm. because I'm ugly, um, but um, people get bored of that. So um, you learn that things like um, you put something interesting in then everyone swap, change the camera every every four or five seconds. You cut to a different scene or show something else. What or or you learn other things like or you just show some scenery and talk over the top and things. So you learn all those things when you do. It's amazing how much you learn on YouTube. It's such a good platform mm. and um and then i just i just took all that knowledge and you just put it in the tiktok so really and i have a bit of god i've built up like so many cameras and stuff now what cameras coming out of my ears now everywhere cameras now. gopros um osmo pockets um i've got i bought a like a, six months ago i bought one of those big proper um Sony cameras, you know, one of those ones with the microphone on and everything. Right, brilliant. <laughs> but um, I don't really use them much. But, but that's I'm so wrapped up at doing all that camera stuff on YouTube that when it came to TikTok, you just use a mobile phone or um, in the, I, you, you get a you get a chance to be a bit more creative sometimes because you don't you don't have to worry about the um, equipment so much. And some of the best videos I've done have just been spontaneous ones. I have like five ideas written down and then suddenly I just wake up or during my lunch hour, I think of a new idea and I just do it straight away. <laughs> like, like your one with the, um, the different types of wood. The, the uh, yeah, that was, one of, that's, <laughs> that was weird like that. It was something like three million views or something like that. <laughs> it's it's amazing it's amazing how yeah, how fast you can you can grow and and uh you know get get your content out there and get eyes in front of it do you have any plans of of you know how is how is your escapades into social media does that influence your career in any kind of way or is there is there another is it is it turning into a side hustle in any uh, not yet. Um, well, that's the thing. I never took it as I'm not doing it for money, really. In fact, I don't. I don't. I never. Well, I put a few. I don't. I never even turned the adverts on in YouTube. Um, I have recently, but it doesn't make much difference. It's practically beer money. It's nothing. You get. You put. You monetize your videos on YouTube. You don't really get much. But um, I never really bothered. But I started turning them on recently to see what it's see well, how much money you actually do get that's nothing much mm. um so i've never really done it for the money there's some people that um god there's some people like um that's their main purpose and it's like you know that's i'm doing it because i just like doing it i'm like i don't even know what i'm doing to be honest <laughs> <laughs> i'm just having fun i don't i'm trying to think of ideas where it can lead me and what paths it could leave me um i've already started actually um work have already asked me to do um drone videos i've already done a couple of drone videos for work like for buildings mm. and they and they put on their um youtube channel 
and I think they're quite pleased with them. I've done so I'm starting to do um, like um, and uh, it wasn't just drone. There's some other video bits in the in the video I did, not just drone. So like I, so I've started to do videos now for work. Um, um, for buildings, you know, filming buildings. Mm. That's that's that because I'm because you know I'm oh and I did get into trouble. Um, we um um we we had a project here. Our company owns a shopping centre. We finished, and one of the tenants at the pharmacy, um, they um I, I did a TikTok when I told everyone how much prices of masks were um, for the coronavirus and I got, in, they, I got into trouble at work because the, the tenant said that I've been telling everyone um, their prices are bad, which I didn't. I just told people <laughs> um, what the prices were. And I, thought, yeah. I, thought, I thought I was helping them because that's where you can buy masks from. Yeah. And um, it got like quite a lot of views and... Um, I think it had a bit of an influence on um, on the shop, you know. People might have been going in there and saying things and stuff because God, I can't believe it. TikTok's quite powerful, you know. Like mm. um, um, you reach so many people. And it's like well, I think that, one, that that video I had to I had to um, unpublish that one um, because they were complaining. Um, but that, that was because it was least, loosely related to work. That's why. Right. Um, right. But that, that, that's just shows you how powerful that can it can be. You know, just a, it's like it's only a fifteen second video for God's sake, and they're worried that it would jeopardize jeopardize their sales mm. for masks. Um, but in terms of opportunities, um, uh, what's, hey, um trying to think of some, uh, some in in terms of um just to sort of uh wrap up what, what's happening in tanzania in terms of lockdown and the coronavirus has that had a big impact on yeah. on you guys and your work at the moment um that's, honestly speaking I've, i'm still going to work every day i haven't um, I haven't been locked down yet. Um, um, our office is quite spacious, um, so we it's not that our office at the moment is about ten to fifteen, ten to fifteen people, but we sit far apart. Mm. So we're not. The, our head office is. Um, I think they're doing alternative days now. But, um, it's starting to get a bit bad now. Um, um, the. Um, the cases are starting to go up now. I think now's the time it's starting to get bad, so we don't know yet really what's going to happen. But so far, it hasn't been that bad. Uh, only two weeks ago, um, they told everyone has to wear masks outside the government. But that was only a couple of weeks ago. There hasn't been there hasn't been any official lockdown as such. No, um, no. But um, see what happens in the next few weeks and months. Really. Got it. But we're not. I'm not going out, you know, at all. Really, just going to work and staying in. Right. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Great. Well, Russell, thank you so much for your contribution today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and hearing about your career and your your travels and. I thoroughly love watching you on TikTok and I'll continue to to do so and recommend that all the uh, all the listeners of Business of Architecture go on go on to TikTok and <laughs> start their own accounts and start following you and enjoying your videos as well. So but thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me. I've my, enjoyed it. My absolute pleasure. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond or commitment except to help you 
be unstoppable.